Good evening, students, ladies and gentlemen. From our flagship corporate lecture series, Leadership and Entrepreneurship Aspiration Development Program, Asian Education Group brings to you an enthralling personality amidst us today, carrying <laughs> moonshine with him. On behalf of Asian Education Group, I welcome you all to this webinar, The Tenth Man to Walk on the Moon, in conversation with the American former astronaut and the lunar module pilot of Apollo 16, Mr. Charles Duke. Charles Moss Duke Jr. was born on October 3rd, 1935. He's an American former astronaut, US Air Force officer and test pilot. As lunar module pilot of Apollo 16 in 1972, he became the 10th and the youngest person to walk on the moon at the age of 36 years and 201 days. A 1957 graduate of the United States Naval Academy, he joined the US Air Force. He completed advanced flight training on the F-86 Sabre at Moody Air Force Base in Georgia, where he was a distinguished graduate. After completion of this training, Duke served three years as a fighter pilot with the 526th Fighter Interceptor Squadron at Ramstein Air Base in West Germany. After graduating from the Aerospace Research Pilot School in September 65, he stayed on as an instructor teaching control systems and flying in the F-101 Voodoo, F-104 Starfighter, and T-33 Shooting Star. In April 1966, Duke was one of 19 men selected for NASA's fifth group of astronauts. In 1969, he was a member of the astronaut support crew for Apollo 10. He served as Capcom for Apollo 11, the first crew landing on the moon. His distinctive Southern drawl became familiar to audiences around the world as the voice of a mission control made nervous by a long landing that almost expended all of the lunar module Eagle's fuel. Following his retirement from NASA, Duke entered the Air Force Reserve and served as a mobilization augmentee to the commander, USAF Basic Military Training Center, and to the commander USAF recruiting service. He graduated from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces in 1978. He was promoted to Brigadier General in 1979 and retired in June 86. He has logged 4,147 hours flying time, of which 3,632 hours is in jet aircraft and 265 hours in space, including 21 hours and 38 minutes of EVA. A resident of New Braunfels, Texas, he has chaired the board of directors of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. He has been awarded the NASA Distinguished Service Medal, the JSC Certificate of Commendation 1970, the Air Force Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster and AF Legion of Merit, and Air Force Command Pilot Astronaut Wings. He has been named South Carolina Man of the Year in 1973 and inducted into the South Carolina Hall of Fame in 1973. He was named Texan of the Year for 2020. Honorable speaker for today, Mr. Charles Duke, we delightedly welcome you to this platform. Students are eagerly waiting to listen to you. I hand over the session to you. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, Central Texas, uh, early morning over here, evening for you. Uh, it's a delight to be here and have this invitation to uh, join this webinar through the uh, uh, Asian Education Group. Uh, and I appreciate the uh, miracle of technology where we can be face to face uh, and yet not uh, uh, touching one another due to this COVID problems. Anyway, it's a delight to be here. Uh, I'd like to uh, just amplify a few remarks that uh, were made during my introduction. Uh, I grew up in a very small town in South Carolina, and uh, most uh, boys my age then never went to college even. Uh, they, we, we were a big textile town, and so most people went to work in the cotton mills. It was a good job and uh, stable back in those days. So, uh, but I had a dream. I wanted to be a naval officer like my father was in World War II. So I chose the Naval Academy, but when I got to the Naval Academy, I realized I loved airplanes more than I did ships. And back then uh, I could volunteer for the Air Force. And so I chose the Air Force uh, for my career. 
And uh, I was in flight school in uh, September of uh, 1957 when Sputnik was launched, the first satellite uh, to orbit the Earth uh, launched by the Russians. To me, that was the beginning of the space age. Up until that point, uh, I didn't think much about space. Uh, we did not study space, and uh, particularly at the Naval Academy in those days, mostly marine engineering and things like that. Uh, but uh, they, as I said, I fell in love with the airplanes. And so I began to uh, focus on uh, a flight career. Uh, so my career just sort of took uh, uh, steps uh, uh, slightly deviating uh, from my original plans. I know many of you are thinking about your careers and, uh, and I have advice for you, study hard, take care of yourself and uh, keep your uh, antennas up, if you will, because you never know when you get these urges uh, to sort of uh, deviate slightly in your career. Uh, which can lead to a very, very exciting uh, adventure for you, as it did for me. So in um, uh, 1959, I was assigned to Germany. Uh, wonderful job, exciting job, uh, flying airplanes uh, over in Germany. And uh, when I got there in 1959, the first astronauts were selected. There were seven uh, U.S. astronauts. The Russians had their cosmonauts going. A couple of years later, uh, in 1961, uh, we had the first human being into space, uh, which was an amazing uh, event and feature for me. I was enthralled. Uh, Yuri Gagarin was launched in April 1961. Shortly after that, uh, in early May 1961, Alan Shepard became the first American. Uh, to launch into space. Well, you know, the astronauts, uh, that career excited me, but I wasn't qualified. Uh, and I didn't really have a dream to be an astronaut, but I, serving my country, the Air Force wanted me to go back to school. So I uh, was assigned to a master's program at Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology, MIT. And while I was there, uh, I realized that uh, the Apollo program had been announced in 1961 uh, by President Kennedy, and they were well underway of working on uh, the goal of landing a person on the moon by the end of 1969. Uh, one of the uh, exciting things at MIT at that time, they had the contract to build the Apollo guidance and navigation system. And they needed an operational pilot to, to sort of evaluate what they were building. Was it operable by uh, a human pilot? And so I uh, did my master's thesis on this program it was more a statistical analysis. And as a result, I met some astronauts, a uh, uh, second group, the third group of astronauts, and they were very motivated, very excited about their job. And so I began to dream about that. And I knew that what I had to do after I graduated was to go to test pilot school. So in July of 1965, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 1964, uh, I started my career as a, uh, a, test, a student test pilot. The next year I graduated and, uh, and went on staff uh, for the uh, test pilot school. And in September of 1965, NASA uh, had a, uh, an article in the paper uh, that said uh, we're seeking more astronauts, please apply. Well, I read the uh, requirements uh, to be in it, to, be, to apply, and I was qualified, so I volunteered. And that was those, those uh, former astronauts that were at MIT, came to MIT and allowed me to talk to them and speak to them, motivated me that if I ever had the chance, that's the job that I wanted. And so I was selected in April of 1966. Uh, the uh, first flight of Apollo was uh, ended in disaster uh, before it even left the launch pad. Apollo 1 caught fire in January 1967 and killed uh, three crewmen. All 
also about that time, we had a series of accidents in the astronaut office and we had uh, four astronauts killed in uh, airplane crashes. Uh, one killed an automobile accident. Uh, many retired, the older ones like uh, John Glenn and uh, Scott Carpenter. And so of the 54 of us that had been selected, there were only around 40, 42 that were actually qualified to fly. And once we recovered from the accident of Apollo 1, uh, it was uh, uh, full speed ahead, if you will, to, to make it to the moon. After Apollo 1, we had nine missions to the moon. Uh, and I was fortunate to work on five of those missions. Of the nine missions, six were successful landings. So there were 12 of us, uh, two astronauts per mission that stepped onto the moon. And as you heard in the introduction, I was number 10 because we were the fifth landing. And as we learned more about uh, our capabilities, uh, the missions were extended from 24 hours to 36 hours to 72 hours on the lunar surface. Uh, of course, uh, the last three missions that were uh, there were uh, what we call J missions that had a little uh, electric car called the lunar rover, which revolutionized lunar exploration. And the missions became more from engineering to science. We had an extensive experiments package called the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package that contained a variety of experiments. And so we were motivated to learn those, to learn geology, uh, what kind of rocks to collect on the moon, uh, those kind of training and learn how to fly the spacecraft. Uh, we were spending 60 to 80 hours a week in training uh, to uh, get ready to go uh, on uh, our missions. As I said, I was operation, uh, I worked uh, as a, uh, in some respect on five of the nine missions to the moon. Uh, my first involvement was Apollo 10, uh, which was uh, uh, the first time we took the lunar module to the moon, but uh, wasn't capable of landing. I was in mission control as a capsule communicator or CAPCOM. And then on the next mission, we were gonna attempt our first landing, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Mike Collins were the crew. And uh, so I was in Capcom again. So as we started our descent uh, onto the moon, the voice you hear on that loop that's all on the web now uh, is uh, my voice. Uh, and uh, I was the only one in mission control that could actually talk to the crew. And so as we started our descent, uh, we started having a series of very serious problems. First, uh, communications. We had to maintain communication to get the data and understand the, how the spacecraft was performing. So we fixed those problems. Then we had a computer problem. We had a, a very rudimentary computer compared to ours today, but it was the state of the art in those days and it uh, worked. We had 80K memory in that little computer, but it had five programs in it that would uh, guide the uh, vehicle to landing and lift off and ascent and rendezvous. So we had a computer overload uh, that was very serious, but our mission control team fixed it uh, and solved the problem. We continued our descent. Uh, then we had a trajectory problem that led Neil into a, an area of the moon that was unsuitable for landing. So he had to uh, take over and fly over this, uh, this area. And as a result, uh, was uh, used a lot of extra fuel. So now we're minimum fuel. And uh, I remember one of my last transmissions for mission control was Eagle, uh, 60 seconds. It meant he had 60 seconds to land. Then I called Eagle 30 seconds and he, he still went on the ground. So the mat, you can imagine the tension in mission control as we were 30, 40 feet off the moon and we're running out of fuel. So a uh, few seconds later, Buzz Aldrin, the lunar module pilot said, the contact engine stop. And we knew they were on the ground. It was a great sigh of relief. And uh, this calm voice, Neil Armstrong, in a couple of seconds after they 
uh, uh, safety the uh, spacecraft and all. He said, uh, Houston, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. So our first attempt was successful. Uh, after that, uh, we had, I was involved in the backup of Apollo 13. Uh, and uh, the only one that mission that we went to the moon planning to land that we didn't get to land was Apollo 13 because they had a major uh, oxygen tank explosion on the way to the moon. And we were very, very fortunate to re uh, get them back. Uh, then on Apollo 16, I was the, uh, uh, the lunar module pilot. And we spent three days on an area of Descartes uh, moon. As you look at the moon from the earth, we were almost in the center, a little east and a little south of center. We were 8,000 feet in altitude, uh, 2,500 meters above where Neil Armstrong had landed. And so we had a unique set of rocks and a unique set of experiments. Uh, it was very exciting being on the moon. I felt right at home. There was no sense of danger. There was no uh, uh, evil feeling presence uh, like you see in the Star Wars movie. We just felt like we belonged. It was the most beautiful, serene place uh, that I'd ever seen. Since there's no atmosphere, you don't, here outside your spacesuit. The noises are from inside your spacesuit. And so we had good communications with one another and with Houston. And we were scheduled to uh, drive our car uh, over a maximum of about uh, five kilometers from where we had landed. And we were able to do that over the subsequent three days. The moon surface is covered with very, very fine dust like powder, mostly gray in color. And uh, it was so exciting being there. I never overcame the awe and the excitement that I had of being stepping on the moon and driving across this very rough terrain. Uh, that was uh, a, a com a tremendously beautiful to me, though it was stark a barren, as Buzz said, magnificent desolation. So we were successful in all of our uh, activities. Uh, we had uh, 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 about uh, 98 kilos of moon rock and soil samples that we selected. As I said, the moon was covered with this very, very fine dust like powder. And it was so thin and, and fine that it would get on your suits and your suits was turning gray. I never had a moment of fear except one time when I tried to see how high I could jump and, and I jumped and I fell over backwards. Down here on the earth I weighed uh, in all of my uh, equipment on, uh, I weighed about a hundred and uh, no, uh, 365 pounds, 180 kilos, almost 180 kilos, 165 maybe. But up on the moon, divide that by six. So you could have freedom of motion, but it was easy to lose your balance. And so we fell down a lot and that got us dirty. I fell, when I fell over on my back one time, that was uh, uh, not terrifying, but very fearful. Fear is not a bad emotion if one responds with training and action rather than panic. And so I rolled right, broke my fall, bounced onto my back, my heart was pounding, but I realized I was still alive. The problem was falling on your back real hard. The life support system is on your back and it contained all the oxygen and all the uh, controls and all of the pressure regulators and everything. If it broke, uh, you were dead uh, quickly. And so uh, it held together and I began to calm down uh, and uh, then uh, the final, one of the final things I did that was uh, very meaningful for me was I had a small snapshot or a photograph of my family. Uh, my two sons were five and seven at the time. My wife and I, we had this picture in, taken in, uh, of the family. And on the back of the picture, I'd written, this is the family of astronaut Charlie Duke from planet Earth who, uh, landed on the moon in April 1972. And I dropped it on the moon, took a picture of the picture. 
And uh, the picture's still there. Uh, unfortunately, after 48 years of, of, of cosmic radiation and temperature variations from of a plus 400 Fahrenheit to uh, uh, minus uh, 270 Fahrenheit, uh, it's uh, unrecognizable. But the, the little piece of it is still there. Uh, it was a wonderful experience uh, being on the moon. I wanted to go back again, but uh, never got that chance. Of the 12 of us that walked on the moon uh, during uh, Apollo, uh, only four of us are left alive. Uh, and uh, as you, in my introduction, I was the youngest on the moon and I'm still the youngest that's still on the moon. But I think my record's gonna be broken here in the next uh, decade uh, with Artemis and other nations working for uh, 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 trips, returns to the moon. And I'm very excited about that. I think the future of space is uh, very, very exciting uh, with the privatization of space, uh, tourism in space. Uh, the space station is, uh, is uh, doing a tremendous job now after 20 years of being permanently manned in space. It's still great operational uh, uh, learning uh, facility. One day we'll uh, be able to uh, launch a, a trip to Mars. Uh, some of you young students uh, that uh, listening to this webinar uh, might be there uh, and be one of the crew. Uh, it's gonna be a very demanding mission, uh, but something I think we should mm -hmm. undertake and uh, should do. So uh, I look forward to some questions for you and um, I'd uh, like to continue uh, our discussion. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity just to share my experiences with you. One thing I would like to say uh, to, uh, just to get you in perspective of what it is on the moon, it's in Apollo, you were always there in the daylight from sunrise to sunset on the moon is two weeks, of course. So we were there during the early morning and the temperatures uh, uh, at our landing when we were there were about uh, 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, when we left, it was 115 centigrade. So the higher the sun uh, came into the sky, the hotter the surface gets. Uh, but you don't feel that because your suit is a good insulator. The problem in space is dissipating the body heat. It's, a, it's an environment inside that suit where you're working hard and you have to remove uh, the body heat that's generated due to your work activity. Uh, we had a very efficient system called a liquid cool garment uh, that did that. But if it broke uh, and you couldn't plug into your other uh, uh, teammates uh, system, you had 30, sec uh, 30 minutes before you hit heat stroke. So there were some dangers, but everybody was trained and we had a team that worked together and uh, made it possible. Without mission control, none of Apollos would have been as successful as they were. So I learned a lot about teamwork and the importance of planning and the importance of preparation. And then uh, the performance generally works out when you do a third job of planning, third job of preparing, uh, and then you can hope uh, and pray that the, uh, the, the plan works out. And in Apollo, it always did. We could always overcome uh, any problem that we faced. Uh, and uh, fortunately, we had a very successful Apollo program in Artemis, uh, which I found out the other day. And, uh, Greek mythology, it's the sister of Apollo. So uh, we'll be returning to the moon uh, in this decade. And I hope to uh, uh, greet some of you on your return uh, from the moon. So no matter what you do, uh, pick a career that you like uh, and uh, that you're excited about. Uh, and that's why I went engineering. And that's why I went into flight training. It's because I, it was something I was excited about. It just got me stimulated. And so that, I think that's very important for you to, as you seek your direction in your career to uh, 
uh, choose a path uh, that will uh, lead to a, uh, a satisfying a, a career for you, something you like to do that you get excited about. Uh, and uh, that will be the best choice for you. So I uh, look forward now to a time of uh, uh, question and answers from the panel. And thank you for listening. I can't see all of you, but I hope that uh, uh, my, uh, I came through loud and clear and uh, uh, that I stimulated you uh, as you study and continue your career. So thank you very much, uh, Godspeed. So thank you very much for that uh, exciting uh, expression of your experience, uh, uh, Mr. Duke. We have a horde of questions for you, but uh, I have a feeling that you've answered most of them, you know, in your talk. So I'll have to pick and choose the ones so that we can meet the deadline. So, okay. uh, yeah. So uh, you said that uh, you've left a photo of your family on the moon. I'd like to ask you, of course, the, que the question has come from the student. When we go to a new place, we want to get something from there to keep as a souvenir. Did you pick anything from the crest of the moon to keep with you? Uh, we were not allowed to keep moon rocks, uh, so I don't have a moon rock. Uh, but parts of the spacecraft, uh, the, the netting we were able to pull off and uh, some of the pack baggages, uh, bags that were uh, con contained some of our equipment. Uh, then we had uh, what we call personal preference kits. Uh, they were items that we were allowed, personal items that we were allowed to take with us and return with us. And so we have things like that. We, I have all of the, the procedure manuals that we had, all of the schematics, uh, we were allowed to uh, uh, keep those. And uh, so, uh, they are in my collection. A lot of them are in museums. I've donated a lot of stuff to museums, but uh, I do have uh, some personal items uh, uh, that are uh, very meaningful. Uh, I uh, uh, had some jewelry that I uh, had made special for my wife and my mom and mother-in-law, things like that, that I took with me and brought back and then uh, presented them to uh, my, my family mostly. Okay. But you, you must surely have brought back moon dust. Oh, we did. We brought yeah. back a lot of moon dust. Uh, it was uh, the, like the patches that I have here is not one that we flow, but I, I have the patches from my spacesuit, and they were covered with moon dust. Uh, the exterior of the space group, we couldn't cut off parts of it, but we, uh, uh, as we tracked back in uh, the lunar module, we brought in a lot of moon dust and a lot of the equipment that we did collect and bring back with us were covered uh, with moon dust. <clears throat> but it's so fine, you, <clears throat> you can't uh, brush it off. Uh, the more you brush, the more it gets into the fabrics. Uh, so as I said, it's like powder, uh, very, very fine powder. Uh, it, uh, it had a strange odor to it. Uh, once you got it back inside and you, uh, you, I think it picked up the oils. Uh, it's so dry uh, since there's no moisture on the moon uh, that it picks up the, the oils from your skin. And when you smelled it, it smelled like gunpowder to me. And, uh, but there was no organic material up there. So it, it wasn't explosive, uh, but uh, it had that, that very distinct odor. It, and that's the, one of the things I remember about the moon dust, except uh, how it got into everything. And so on these future missions, you're gonna need a very good airlock. Uh, that's gonna be a design. That so when you live there for a month or so, and you go outside, you need an airlock to get suited up and then unsuit and then you step into a clean environment and leave the suits and everything and the moon dust uh, out, out in the airlock. So it's gonna be very important to have a, a, a functioning, uh, reliable airlock. How much time did it take Apollo 16 to reach the moon surface? Uh, we landed, uh, it was uh, 
102 hours after uh, I think we landed. But it, uh, the trajectory in Apollo took 72 hours to get to the moon. And that trajectory was designed because of the amount of fuel we had on board. You can get to the moon more direct, like 10 or 12 hours, uh, but you're going so fast when you get there that you, in Apollo, you didn't have enough fuel to slow down and get into orbit. So our trajectory was 72 hours to the moon. Uh, then we landed, uh, we spent a day in orbit, and then we landed on the uh, fifth day. Uh, the second, uh, and then we had a three-day journey home. Uh, and so for us, uh, we were 11 days. We were scheduled for 12 days, but due to some problems, uh, Mission Control uh, had us come home a day early. Well, this question talks about describing the view when you stood on the Descartes Highland on the moon. The uh, uh, view was uh, uh, incredible. Uh, on the second day, we drove our car to the south up uh, a small, about a hundred meter tall mountain called Stone Mountain. And as we turned around and looked across the valley, we, we had a valley about 10 kilometers, maybe 12 kilometers wide. And you could see on the opposite side uh, to the north, uh, uh, was uh, the Stone Mountain. I mean, uh, not Stone Mountain, but uh, Smoky Mountains and uh, uh, the craters. And it was the most spectacularly beautiful view. Since there's no atmosphere, everything was so sharp, even to the horizon. And you could see uh, the sun was very bright and the, gr the grays of the moon uh, and some white and some black rocks, but generally shades of gray. And right at the horizon, the break of the horizon, you could look up and it was just this uh, velvety black uh, space uh, when the sun's shining is absolutely black. And uh, it, you felt like you could reach out and touch it. Uh, sometimes I felt like I was overcome with the beauty of the moon. This is the most magnificent place. Unfortunately, from where we stood on the moon, the earth was directly over our head. And so in an Apollo spacesuit, it's like being in a big fishbowl and you look up and you're looking at the inside of your helmet. So on the moon, I very rarely uh, could see the earth uh, except looking through our little uh, telescope uh, thing that we had. Uh, but in orbit, uh, you came around from the uh, far side of the moon and you watched Earth rise. And uh, I don't know how many times we saw that once every two hours while we were in orbit. Uh, for John and I was two days in orbit, one before we landed and then that one after we landed. And I was looking every time as we came from the back and uh, side and uh, saw this uh, jewel of Earth just suspended in the blackness of space. On the moon, as I said, it was almost daylight. So when it's daylight, you don't see any stars. Uh, you look up and you can see the earth if you're in the right position. The only other objects are visible is the sun uh, and uh, the rest of the sky is uh, black because the sun's so bright, reflection from the lunar surface uh, is so bright that you can't see, uh, can't see any of the stars in the sky. How beautiful. Virgin Galactic and SpaceX are putting a lot of emphasis on space tourism and with both of them having set some sort of deadlines for themselves. Taking it further ahead, do you believe that we can ever set up colonies on the moon? Uh, a colony on the moon, I think is very feasible. Uh, I think we'll start out with a, uh, some inflatable structures uh, the uh, spacecraft that we fly to the moon will be called Orion, which I call Apollo on steroids. It can carry six or so people uh, and uh, capable of then the, depending on who, how the lander is, how many people we land uh, will be uh, determined. But then we'll start building infrastructure, I believe on the moon 
because I believe that a, a science based on the moon would be extremely valuable for uh, gaining uh, uh, science knowledge about not only about the moon, about the mining activities, the composition of the moon to in, in detail, and also just uh, looking out into the heavens uh, with telescopes and uh, other kind of instruments. So I see uh, eventually, a, uh, I wouldn't call it a colony, but certainly manned uh, habitation modules and vehicles that then we can explore uh, across the moon. And uh, to me, that would be very similar to the uh, science stations we have in Antarctica. Very hostile environment in Antarctica, but people are living there. And uh, so the same will be available on the moon, I believe. Uh, and uh, we'll start slowly, of course, uh, and uh, start building on our uh, knowledge and building on our abilities. Uh, I think uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin, uh, Boeing uh, Starliner, all of that's gonna be near Earth orbit for a while. But eventually, they'll be taking passengers and tourists into space. And uh, I think that will generate so much interest in space among the populations of the world uh, that we're going to see a resurgence of, of, uh, in, of em emphasis in space. And then eventually, I think we will uh, uh, send uh, human beings to Mars. That will be a very, very challenging mission uh, because once you leave Earth orbit on the trajectory to Mars, you're basically on your own. You've either got to repair it, uh, fix it, change out the systems, uh, do medical stuff if you get sick. Uh, and it's, it's very little think, very little help you can get from uh, mission control. Uh, especially at Mars distances with the time delay between hello from Mars to you hear hello in, in, in on Earth. So uh, it'll be a challenging mission, but I think this human spirit is to explore and to go out and not only explore deep space, but inner space and the deep depths of the ocean. So I think that's built into our psyche, uh, that uh, sense of exploration and uh, I probably won't be here uh, on earth, uh, uh, be passed on uh, by the time we uh, uh, have humans to Mars, but uh, my grandchildren will see that, I'm convinced. And I'm convinced that the, the mountains that we climb today or climbed in Apollo has taken our children and grandchildren to a a different perspective and they're able to look beyond uh, to the challenges uh, that they will face and can face them with confidence and assurance uh, by building on the foundations of uh, the U.S. and the space program, the International Space Station and those uh, inter internation efforts have that have been so valuable and uh, so rewarding. So uh, just one comment, my dad was 65 years old when I went to the moon and he was born in 1907. So he saw the early jet ages and all of the aviation and he could hardly believe his son went to the moon. My youngest boy was five years old when I went to the moon. He didn't think it was any big deal the whole neighborhood was going to the moon. Uh, astronauts next door, uh, Neil Armstrong lived a block away. So he grew up in this environment of uh, challenge and uh, determination. And uh, so uh, I see, uh, you know, that kind of spirit in a lot of young people today that uh, they're gonna accept that challenge uh, that they're presented uh, whatever that may be, whether it be in medicine, engineering, law, whatever your career is, uh, you're going to have some challenges. So face them, prepare, and uh, you'll be very, uh, have a very rewarding career.
uh, Mr. Duke, uh, you live to be 200 because you touched the moon and you came back. We have a student <laughs> in, waiting in the wings for you. Can we have the question by the student, please? Uh, greetings of the day, sir. It's an honor to put you up a question. So, sir, my question to you is that what do you think of a manned mission to Mars? Because some say go back to moon first and some say go straight away to the Mars. I'm sorry, what was the, what, uh, the last part of the question? Some people say so, what? Uh, some people say go to the moon first and some people say go back to Mars. Well, it depends on who you talk to. Buzz Aldrin, who was number two on the moon, said, we've been to the moon, let's go to Mars. Uh, and he has plans for that. But I think it's been so long since we've been out into deep space that the moon is the, is the easiest and most accessible uh, deep space object uh, that we could then build a station and start developing the systems and the reliability in these systems that we're gonna to need uh, to place on Mars and to take us to Mars. So I think it's a building block. My, uh, my suggestion is uh, let's return to the moon. Uh, there are arguments on the other side. Why wait, we've been there, uh, let's go press on and uh, go to Mars. But as I said earlier in the program, Mars is a tremendous, uh, I think an order of magnitude harder uh, adventure than the moon was. So what, so what, is, what is the far side of the moon? Apollo 16 crossed the far side of the moon and is there life there on the far side? Uh, there's no life on the moon, no atmosphere on the moon. So there's no organic material on the moon anywhere. Uh, while we were in orbit, we had half the far side in darkness and half was in sunlight. And it's very, very rough on the backside or the far side, the part we don't see. Uh, it's it's uh, tremendously cratered, no big mari like on the uh, front side. Uh, and uh, so it would be, to me, very difficult, not impossible, but very difficult to land on the far side. Uh, John and I suggested that we on Apollo 16 land on the far side, but. Houston said, we need communications with you guys, and uh, we're not letting you land back over there and not have communi uh, 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 constant communication. So they wouldn't approve it, of course. But uh, eventually, somebody's going to want to land back there. Uh, the Chinese have done unmanned stuff. Uh, and uh, with, with a satellite in the right place, communication satellite, one of the Longeron points, uh, we can have constant communications. And so eventually, I think we will have uh, exploration of the backside. It's, uh, it's rough, though. Uh, it would be very difficult to find a, uh, in many areas, to find a suitable place to land. Okay. One last question, uh, Mr. Duke. And just a quick answer to this, a very interesting question. What is the truth behind the UFOs? Is there alien life on moon or anywhere else? Uh, there's no life on the moon, uh, as I said earlier. It's a, the moon is a vacuum. Uh, there's no air. Uh, there's probably some water down and ice down in the southern, uh, around the south pole of the north pole. Uh, so it's a hostile environment. Uh, I have never seen a UFO. Uh, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. I believe in aliens. Uh, we. The universe is huge, uh, but uh, we have never seen uh, or heard uh, any transmissions that were uh, regular from deep space. Uh, none of the astronauts of my generation have ever seen UFOs or anything like that. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, some people say they've seen them, and, uh, but I haven't. And so I don't know whether they're real or not. I personally don't think we are being visited by aliens. So uh, that's my opinion. That's an opinion. So Duke, we've come to the close of the webinar and we're indeed grateful that you accepted our invitation and we got to hear from the man himself. As a token of our appreciation, I request our CEO, Mr. Akshay Marva, to present a memento to you. There has been a lot of excitement amongst the students about this webinar. As you've been there 
where we can only look up at the sky and say, that's the moon. Thank you for delighting us with your presence and we wish we could meet you in person. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Duke. And like I said, you'll live to be a 200 because you touched the moon dust and came back to Earth. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you and to all on the webinar. It's been a very pleasant experience for me. I look back, uh, look forward to my next uh, in-person visit to India. I've been many times and uh, I uh, look forward to every visit I have there. So. Uh, Thank you very much, everyone, and uh, may God bless this uh, this time. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much for being here.